Mr. Chikata asked Chachu a question about whether or not, uh, asked Mr. Blay a question as to whether or not uh, the decision of Asiama, that step he took, uh, you know, is any different from what these individuals have taken going into 2024, uh, the general election. And uh, Mr. Blay, you have the floor to answer that question. My very good friend and lecturer, Chachu, I wanted to know, how do you treat CMS uh, notice of poll, particularly? One, it has a symbol of a MPP attached to the notice of the poll and that kind of thing. That's, at what stage do you consider that to be? It's cross carpet or whatever it is. And as I said, uh, it, it's, it's an interesting question, I must admit. But until I read it, I was maybe also until I read the judgment, I could uh, get a bit confused over it. But fortunately, the, the judgment makes it very clear that indeed this even comes under your purview. You are an excellent uh, jurisprudence, so far as I'm concerned. One and you, 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 that's what you were. <laughs> excellent. Uh, how do you interpret the law as to when you leave? At what stage? And that was what the justice, the justice did. He said he was elected for four years term, the eighth parliament. And they are giving notices of what they want to do in the ninth, come the ninth parliament, except that elections are going to take place sixth, seventh of uh, December. Now, unless you want to say that once you indicate that you're going to take another step come the following or the, from the eighth, the following ninth parliament. If you indicate it, you must stop and maybe wait for about a year or so and be denied the opportunity of going. Maybe. They, they want you to do it and made it clear that whatever step they've taken, so far as they are concerned, leaving parliament was in respect of come the ninth parliament. No, no. That's, 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 that's my understanding of it. Well, you see... That's my understanding. And it, it, to me, it's very clear because it has nothing to do with the eight man four. Yeah, it, indeed, they went ahead even also to take judicial notice of what had happened in the past. Many parliamentarians have changed their status. But on the NDC part, on the MPP part, and in some cases, as individual, independent candidates. It's been in the past like that. Mm. That has not changed their status for the two or three months. In fact, less than three months that they will have to file. They will have to prepare themselves for the oncoming elections. And subsequently, the parliament that we may come to the next year. So that one, and he says that they argue that it's not the intention of the lawmakers to make the constituency or the constituents not have any representation. No. No, is it the intention of the, uh, maybe the, the parliamentarian or the hopeful parliamentarian to continue remain or to, to continue to remain a member of a party while he's moving to some other party or they're going to as an individual. I think it's been explained sufficiently. That creates a little problem as to at what stage can you do that. But it says the two months that remain, unless you want to say that immediately you, and you must file with the electoral commission for them to make preparation, at what stage you file. They went inside, they went into that and explained it very well. And I'm saying that I agree that in terms of their understanding of for uh, 97G and H, it's, it's appropriate that what I've done. And for him, to, for the speaker to say, to declare that they've left parliament by taking those steps, you know, I, I disagree. In fact, well, mm. well I disagree. you see, you, you haven't really answered the question about honorable ACMA situation because I wasn't referring just to his filing the nomination, which is what the judgment was about. They're yes. talking just about the filing of nomination. 
I'm saying that before you even file a nomination, you have to declare your stand in terms of your party to affiliation. Whom? To whom? To the Electoral Commission, for instance. To the Electoral, because you file certain papers, but even before filing the nomination, you have to declare your stance even in terms of the party that you are going to stand on the ticket of. You know, Honorable Asiyama didn't just get up himself and just proclaim that I'm now going to stand on the ticket of a party. He didn't. So, in terms of your standing on the ticket of I, that party, I, I, I think you let, must let have me, a position let, let me make with a that little party. Point. Let me make a little point here, uh, dear Chachu. I am aware that when you want to put up yourself for election, your first contact with the electoral commission, it's not with the party card, but with the party flag. When you go there, in your constituency, you have a list of people who are supporting you. They don't even have to declare that they are members of one party or the other. It's only when you have filed and on which ticket, well, that was last minute, that the party then will send messages that, look, this and this man are going to stand on our ticket. I agree, there will be some interaction between the parties and the electoral commission, but the individual have very little role to play in terms of displaying his identity. But please, let me be very honest. Definitely, when you are standing in the election, on whatever, whatever ticket and so forth, at the, any time, you make you indicate it. You let them know that I'm coming here on this and this and that ticket. But indeed, they don't put a flag on your application. They don't put a flyer on your application until the parties, last minute, had sent a message to the various constituencies and indicating that here are we, anybody standing on my behalf or on my ticket will then use my, go ahead and use my. And, uh, and I want to come to you, Mr. Chikata, about that because what Mr. Blay is talking about, um, if you look at, I think, from page 31 going, the Supreme Court explains that we are a, we are a country which says that you have freedom of association. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you say that I have freedom of association, and I am indicating that I want to be, a, I want to be, say, on a party going into the next parliament. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the Electoral Commission also requires that before you can take part in that next parliament, you need to file processes. Mm -hmm. Those processes are expected to be filed within the parliament you're in. Mm -hmm. But the speaker's stance is indicative of you trying to express that right and yet being punished for it. How no, do you understand no, that? That's, absolutely, that's, absolutely no. That, that's not how the speaker's position should be taken. If you read his communication, it's quite clearly expressed in terms of the language of 97 1G and H of the Constitution. Leaving a political party, being an independent, leaving a political party and joining another or becoming an independent candidate, being an independent and joining a political party. And the reason I start with Honorable Asiyama's example is because it enables us, I think, to see the logic of what the speaker was saying in terms of the question of fact that has to be determined. The logic is that Honorable Asiyama didn't just get up himself and say that I am now going on the ticket of the NPP. He did not. He went through processes within the NPP in which he identified himself as a member of the NPP. So he was no longer an independent candidate. The moment he went through those processes as a member of the NPP, he had ceased to be an independent member for that constituency. And what is clear in our constitution is that he was elected as an independent candidate for Formina. And the moment under 971H, the moment he now says, I am now going through the processes of my party, which I am now identifying with. And remember, he had previously been before he yes. stood independent and so on. So he was now, as it were, going back home. And so the moment he went back home, 
That was before the filing of the nominations. Mm. He went back home and went through the internal processes of his party to be that party's candidate. So you can't say that it's just about his filing a nomination so what do, what do you and make, getting candidates. What do you make of the argument? And, and, mm. and let me just go to your point about the Constitution and its freedom of association, because mm. it is an important point. Precisely because of the freedom of association, it was possible for him to stand as an independent, not as a, uh, you know, it was his choice. And he made the choice to be an independent candidate. On the basis of that, his people in that constituency elected him as such. And what 971H is saying is that once he abandons that position as an independently elected candidate and now joins a political party, not just for the future election, but he joins it in the processes that I've described within this parliament. Once he does that, then he's no longer serving his people as an independent member of parliament for Formina. We've had, and, and, mm. and basically, like I said, the, 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 the Supreme Court, at the end of the day, they didn't say that he had vacated or he had not vacated. But if, if you also... The Supreme Court didn't say yes, that. They but said that's a question of fact. Yes, if you look at the reasons the Supreme Court gave as well, when it started interpreting the G and the H, it said that those were intentions and therefore you cannot use them to say because... And they even went ahead... So you're citing the example of Esiama. Yes. But the Supreme Court cited other examples where MPs gave their intentions, including Joseph Osei Well, you know, the problem with mm. those examples is that the facts about those cases were not before the Supreme Court. I don't, I mean, you know, you just say that. No, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that's, yes, that's the facts were not before that's, the Supreme that's, Court. That's yeah, the that's, facts were that's, not that's before that's the You know, because each of those cases has specific circumstances that yes. the Supreme Court was not seized with. They talked about taking judicial notice. You don't take judicial notice of facts which you have no knowledge about. I, you know, as we speak, nothing in the record of the court shows us that before they made reference to all those people and the past history and so on, they had before them the facts about what had taken place. There's nothing in the record. And, and that's why I'm saying, you know, when you actually look at the decision of the court, unfortunately, it does not really take us to a position of clarity. So what did you do then? It, well, let me finish my point. It doesn't take us to a position of clarity as to whether the seats have been vacated or not. So there's a number of, there's a number of things. They themselves recognize at that page 18 that you referred to, mm. they say it's for the high court. So is a speaker now going to ask the high court to embark on a process or is Honorable Afenyo Makin now going to go to the High Court, which he had been asked by the Speaker's lawyers earlier, he should have done. The Speaker's lawyers, when they made the application to set aside that stay of execution or whatever it was, had made it clear that the High Court is where Honorable Afenyo Makin should have gone in the first place. And, uh, and effectively, that's what the Supreme Court ended up telling us. So do I hear you say, and I'll come to you very shortly, Mr. Blade, do I hear you say that the, the judgment of the court is contradictory? Because if you look at the beginning until the, it started interpreting 97, 1G and H, it built a case around why the procedures of parliament were subservient, uh, subservient to the constitution of the country. And yet went ahead to you know talk about what it did. In fact, it's still agreed with the speaker that yes, if you look at our constitution, 99 means that the high court has to take care of this. That's but exactly right, yes. the one, uh, 131, article 131, also tell, gives us, it says exclusive right to interpret the constitution and therefore as much as determining seats in parliament was concerned, it, dealt, it, it rested with the high court. But in terms of interpretation, yes, it rested... Exclusive? Exclusive jurisdiction to the High Court. No, I'm, I'm saying no. I'm saying that 130 talks about exclusive interpretation 
off the constitution the by the Supreme Court. Yes, right. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Okay. And I'm saying that the court admitted that 99 says the High Court is responsible for determining seats and all of that in Parliament. It was but not. our penure indeed, has come indeed, to us. It's been to, explained. It's and, not, and, and I'll come to you, is, Mr. Blaine. Uh, wait a minute. Well, let, I, let, let me just land on... Let, to help you. No, let me land on my thoughts. I know <laughs> where I'm going. <laughs> and the, But 130 gives Supreme Court the exclusive right to interpret the Constitution. And essentially what he's saying is that we are not determining the seat. We are interpreting Article 97, 1, G, and H. And it is why it felt compelled to come in at this stage. You know, this is the reason why earlier decisions of the Supreme Court, many earlier decisions of the Supreme Court, and even a practice direction that I think was uh, quoted by one of the dissenting judgments, have made it clear that if the real matter in controversy is not what your interpretation will enable you to, give, to, to reach a conclusion on, then you as a Supreme Court, you don't get into that matter. Because the real matter in controversy here is have these members of parliament vacated their seats? And I'm saying to you that on the clear reading of their judgment, at the end of the day, there was no conclusion on that real issue in controversy. Mr. Blair, I want you to come in and we'll go for a break. You want me to come in in respect of what? S you wanted have wanted to, to make a point earlier. The, the point that uh, I think uh, if I'm right, if I uh, want to follow what Chachu is saying, is that uh, the in terms of the facts surrounding whether the uh, individuals, that is the four individuals, they moved out or not, will be a matter of a question of fact, and that in the Supreme Court, that will go through the trials to determine that. But of course, the uh, right honorable speaker, Albert Barwin, uh, had made his determination, or his, what he said, which is the formal statement that he's made in. But it was not based on any fact that he himself had collected. He did say so, he interpreted it. And indeed, he was referring to 97 1G 1, 1A. That's exactly what he was focusing on. And then the Supreme Court, they don't decide who comes, who invokes their jurisdiction or who invokes the, what they, should, they must do. It is uh, Markin who came to say that this interpretation and uh, 2 1 and the rest. It says, this is what it is. The proper interpretation should be this, should be that. And then, do they have the jurisdiction? Does he who had come has capacity to even come with this case? They decided that it's a, he had. Then, jurisdiction. The jurisdiction just as well. The two other judges, that is Tanko and uh, Lovelace, have made their own, uh, what is called, it, comments on it as to whether. They, had a, they have a jurisdiction or not. Because they, they get their own reasoning. And some went into your particular field in terms of uh, uh, jurisprudence and so said a few other things. But definitely, if you read into today, majority decision and how it's been written, it's practical. It it's, it's relates to the actual situation on the ground and what has happened. And then they determine that. It's, look, look here. Uh, in terms of 12G, if you interpret it to make it look like as if once you go, you leave, when they say when you leave, when it's like you've not left in terms of uh, during your term, when you've been elected, but rather as part of the prelude towards the next term, you can't. Yeah, that's be not what the speaker said. I'm sorry. I mean, look. But any fair interpretation then, of then, what then he created the, speaker the confusion said. he created, that's what no. prompted Markin to go. No, the, no, no, because no, no. what Markin it is, went immediately, immediately he said what he went. said. <laughs> immediately he said what he said. Somebody called himself a, a, a majority leader. Yeah, but I'm telling and you that Markin went even before the speaker gave that formal communication. So you can't keep saying that. Markin went because of what the speaker said. So what you're saying and is... Markin basically laid out these, um, you know, reliefs. You know, he set the scene, the filing of nomination, the filing of nomination. He is the one who set the agenda of the Supreme Court in terms of the filing of nomination. And basically, 
That, I think, unfortunately, is the problem that the Supreme Court found itself in. Because at the end of the day, when they themselves recognize that it's really a question of facts which has to be determined, they themselves now concede what they had been told by the counsel for the speaker, you know, when he made a, an application to set aside, that Article 99 requires these matters to be determined by the high court. I mean, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that that's what the application to set aside by the speaker that's what it put before the Supreme So what Court. I hear you say, Mr. Chachichikata, is that this judgment is not fair. It's not about really not being so. fair, but I'm, I'm not, saying well, that I the judgment ends up... I heard him say that if you are interpreting what the speaker said correctly, and I, I heard him use a, a, a fair word, that's well, why I'm asking the, that question. The, 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 the judgment does not fairly reflect what the speaker did, in my view, but mm. I'm saying that beyond that, the judgment does not establish whether those members of parliament have vacated their seats or not. The judgment actually, the majority judgment, tells us in plain words that the factual matter is for the high court to determine. So the conclusion that, and, and they, they, the judgment also claims that the speaker cannot determine that. Now, that is actually problematic. And the reason why that is clearly wrong in my view, you know, if every public official who is occupying a certain position, if they have to determine matters, let's say they, well, let me not use the Electoral Commission as an example because <laughs> it, can, it can be misused. How many days to it the election? It can be misused. Mm -hmm. Let me not use that. But let us say that um, the National Media Commission, it's a, it's a, it's a constitutional body, and they have they have an opportunity um, you know, to take certain steps in the course of their duties. And those steps are in line with their constitutional mandate. So you know, uh, the issue comes before a meeting of the National Media Commission. And the Media Commission, like other statutory bodies, they you know, look at the facts of the situation as brought before them. And they say that, well, our understanding of our mandate leads us to this conclusion. Now, are you going to say that they should have gone, you know, to, let's say, the Supreme Court for an interpretation of their mandate? Because the, 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 the terms of their mandate are in, in, you know, the Constitution. So should mm. they have gone to the Supreme Court? Or, and my reading of previous decisions of the Supreme Court is that all statutory bodies and all public officials in the exercise of their mandate have a responsibility to apply the constitution to and all courts to apply the, to apply the mm. constitution so if you apply the constitution you haven't done anything wrong and yet in this judgment the impression that is given is that the speaker is not allowed to apply the constitution now that's clearly wrong that's or that parliament is not allowed to apply the Constitution. That too must be wrong because these are bodies established constitutionally and if in the exercise of their mandate they have to apply the words of the Constitution, it's not for them each time to have to run to the courts and say, please, interpret this one for me before I take action. Interpret this for me before I take action. That would be a complete mess. Of, 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 of a situation for every public institution. So we'll find out country. what to do with this judgment that's been given by the Supreme Court on this very case and moving forward, really, Don't how it applies. I'll let you come in very shortly when that's we come it. back from that break. You're still here on Agenda. Don't go away. And you're still here on Agenda. Uh, we're discussing that uh, Supreme Court judgment uh, on the issue between it and Parliament, as it were. And let me get that response from Freddie Blay, and then we'll, we'll get the way forward and wrap up this conversation tonight. Yes. Um, uh, Tito had given a few examples, and uh, I, I, I beg to, with respect, to disagree with maybe one or two that he has said, yes, uh, the Constitution is there to guide all of us. Judges even interpret a little in a way. And when a controversy comes up, there have been even instances where the court will stay proceedings. 
you, you are fond of doing that. You will even ask that, look, state procedures, let me have an interpretation of it from the Supreme Court before we continue. Some judges will do that. Some will say that it doesn't need interpretation. I want to go ahead. Maybe you, will go, you move ahead. You can go upstairs and uh, have it cleared. But there are instances where there could be a controversy, for sure. Mm -hmm. Ordinarily, when you are conducting yourself, which you are used to, your affairs in your own department or in your own, you, you could go ahead and do that. But there are instances where it becomes clear. Some people take different positions. And they say, this one, my interpretation of it is wrong. Or your interpretation is also correct. Also, then when that comes up, any of us, any of us, individually, could even say that, look, let's have this one interpreted. On the other hand, and in this particular instance, it's, it's, it's on all fours. He says, when we say that, what you are about to do in terms of your interpretation, and based on interpretation, what you want to do, it will affect the status of four MPs in parliament. It will affect the composition of parliament in a way. And therefore, for that reason, maybe I'm not even, uh, I'm, I'm not even from that uh, constituency. If they could have gone, the, those MPs with a very old constituency, they could have gone. But he, as a caucus leader, decide to take it up, talking about a final market, says that, look, interpretation of this could lead to a whole lot of other things. And me, I think it is wrong the way it is. Then he comes to court, invokes the, the, the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Someone could argue that you could have gone to uh, 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 the uh, High Court with respect to declaring the vacancy in terms of, there are several other circumstances under which you could do that. But in terms of interpretation, it's clear. And considering the term, I want to do it that way. And that's what has, has happened. M Mr. Blair, I it's not that everybody mm. who is having a problem with the, the interpretation will rush to court before it comes to conduct affairs of its uh, department, uh, entity, or whatever it is. But clearly, when it becomes a question of interpretation of the Constitution, and the court has said, even Parliament, in terms of your enactment, even your, uh, your standing orders, if it goes foul of the Constitution, it, it will be, it will be Mr. Well, Blair. In this case, mm. as you know, the Speaker actually was referencing previous precedent within Parliament. And, and I, I just want to say... He did. <laughs> he did. But that did not legalize or nobody took it up to court. For interpretation. There you go. But that's what you were saying, that if there's no controversy, then officials yes, sir, can continue. The controversy so comes, there the wasn't a controversy. Thank you very much. And that will be it for Agenda tonight. My name is Beatrice Edu. Thank you so much for joining us today. I've had uh, with me uh, Chachu Chikata. He's a renowned lawyer, Mr. Chachu Chikata, and also the man who led uh, NDC in that petition, 2012-2013. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. You just said it, so they heard you. And also, I've had uh, Freddie Blay. He is also a lawyer, as well as former uh, deputy, first deputy speaker of parliament. Uh, both of them have helped us to uh, go into this 109-page uh, document. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on Agenda. Join us again next week. Have a good evening. <laughs>